Hello and welcome. My name's Alana Gordon. I'm a reporter at The World covering global health. This is a live uh, Q&A about the coronavirus pandemic and more specifically the disrupted school year in public health. Joining me are Mira Levinson, professor of education at Harvard's Graduate School of Education. Hi, Mira. <laughs> and also we have a, another guest today, Mark Lipsich, professor of epidemiology and director of the Center for Communicable Disease Dynamics at Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Mark, thanks for joining. And I guess in the spirit of um, disclosure, uh, there's also a, a nice connection between the two of you. Um, Mira, I'm wondering if you can tell us viewers what that is. Uh, sure. Mark and I uh, are married. Actually, this will be our 25th wedding anniversary this year, I think. Yes. So Congratulations. Uh, why, thank you. <laughs> so we're all looking forward to hearing both of your, your takes on this really important topic. Um, and for all of you, uh, you can post your questions for us on Facebook at Forum HSPH, or you can email them to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. This Q&A is jointly presented by the Forum at Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the world from PRX and GBH. It's been almost 10 months, which is hard to believe, since schools in the United States started closing their doors because of the pandemic and around the world. Teachers and school districts, again this fall, reconvened with strategies they hoped would keep learning on track, keep kids and school staff safe. And around the globe, it's been a constantly changing patchwork of in-person and hybrid learning programs. So Mira, let's start with you. Can you give us a sense of how school closures and remote learning are affecting students right now? Like, What's the landscape? Sure, um, so we're in a better place than we were and a worse place than obviously anybody would like us to be. So, you know, at the height of the school closures, um, over 90% of schools around the world were closed and we had nearly 2 billion children affected. And of course, the ripple effects for families meant that, you know, virtually every person in the world was affected by school closures, uh, even, you know, setting aside everything else that, about the coronavirus um, that was affecting us. Now we have um, about, according to UNESCO, about 213 million um, students, uh, that's going from basically pre-K through higher education, who are right now uh, engaged in fully remote learning. And then there are a lot more uh, students who are engaged in hybrid learning or who aren't being forced to attend to be remote from schools, but are choosing to be remote from schools. So we ha still have, you know, I clearly well over a quarter billion students who are who've probably who've not set foot in their classrooms in some cases for 10 months. Um, uh, here in the United States, actually, it appears that it may be as much as a third of um, public school students who also have not actually set foot in a classroom for the last 10 months, and many of whom may just be cut off from um, meaningful education altogether. And it's having immense impacts on obviously students' academic learning, their social emotional learning, their um, social emotional well being, uh, their access to services such as uh, you know, therapeutic services, special education, their access to food, uh, medical services, et cetera. Mark, I wanna ask you just kind of in kicking things off, how does that play into um, the science of of kind of determining policies around the pandemic and how coronavirus factors into approaches to school learning. Um, now we're looking at a, a variant that appears to be more transmissible as well. So how does the, the needs, as Mira's talked about with students, play into how you're looking at the spread of this coronavirus and how to contain it? That's a great question. I think that the, um, the, some history is relevant in that when we began thinking about the response to this pandemic, there was a throw every control measure possible because we don't know how bad it is, but we've seen that it can be terrible uh, in Wuhan and then in Iran and Italy and elsewhere as the as it was beginning to spread around the world. Um, and closing schools is one of the classic control measures for infectious diseases because typically children are very important uh, vectors for the disease and schools are much denser, less well ventilated um, environments uh, than most other places that people spend their time. Um, 
in one of the pandemic preparedness exercises that was done for flu some years back, uh, they, they estimated that if you made a, an average sized house uh, have the density of people that are in a class in a school, then you would have about 60 people in a single family house. So that's kind of the, the densities that we're typically dealing with. Um, so that was one of the early control measures and it was quite appropriate because we didn't understand much about transmission and all the, all the um, prior knowledge and not just from flu was that this would be an important control measure. Um, as public health goes from making decisions under uncertainty to trying to make more fully evidence informed decisions, um, of course, we try to refine our policies and it has become clear over the last um, several months that children, especially younger children about under about the age of 10 are less uh, at risk from getting the disease, from getting the infection. They seem to be less likely to transmit the infection, um, although the data for that are a little bit less clear um, and they are uh, less likely to uh, get very sick if they do get infected. So the, so the balance has changed and there's sort of a mantra now that schools should be the last to close and the first to open. And I think that really is both uh, based on the evidence about the absolutely crucial nature of schools, um, in addition to all of what Mira mentioned for the economy uh, and for their childcare roles and letting people do other things, parents do other things, um, but also because the data are starting to show or are, are emerging that um, at least the, the younger grades uh, are typically not major foci of transmission. Um, and there have just been papers coming out in the last few days uh, reaffirming that if there are uh, significant control measures in place. Um, and we could talk about some of those later, but, um, but it is important uh, to do that. So I think we've gone from a reactive, we have to stop this virus and then think about it uh, to thinking about it more and gathering more data. And that's appropriate. That's what we should be doing. Um, and, and it's good that there is some chance to run schools in a safe way. Mary, uh, I wanted to ask you, you know, you mentioned so much um, of so many students have been remote learning so many around the globe and in the US. Um, and of course, we're starting to see this week, Greece is reopening elementary schools. We see schools in Chicago and other places. Um, but what do you see as um, being, what worries you about what's being lost right now as students are remote? Well, so as I mentioned, schools around the world, although particularly in countries that do not otherwise have a robust social safety net, are the location in which um, young people and often their families as well, tend to get the majority of the social services um, that they are, you know, deserve um, and are entitled to. So uh, just, you know, one uh, figure that I found extraordinarily striking when I learned this earlier, um, that, like in the spring of last year, is that 95% of children in the United States who end up gaining access to mental health services do so initially through their schools. Now, as we know, there's actually considerable evidence at this point that children who are trying to learn remotely and who are not physically in schools are really suffering mentally, right? Um, you know, anxiety, depression, isolation, uh, as well as they are more vulnerable to um, abuse, uh, you know, and so forth when they are at home. And uh, what we've done is made life much harder for <laughs> children and simultaneously taken away the uh, access point that so many kids have to the services uh, that they need. I also just worry about kids who are hungry, right? I mean, um, again, schools in many places around the world are the institution that feed uh, vulnerable young people. And although, again, around the world, schools and districts uh, and ministries of education and so forth have geared up to try to figure out other ways of getting uh, food to kids and getting kids and families to food, none of that has been nearly as successful as um, 
you know, school-based provision has uh, been. Also, the last thing I'll say is that uh, we're just seeing uh, an ever increasing exacerbation of inequality uh, at the school level. Um, so students uh, who say are vulnerable because they're homeless or because they have um, special needs and so forth are getting less and worse than the kids who say have, you know, a reliable place to study who don't need, you know, special services. We're seeing that at the district level, we're seeing that at the state level, at the national level, and then among nations. So uh, the majority of schools that are still closed, other than, uh, say, the United States, actually are in the global south, whereas overwhelmingly over the last 10 months, this, uh, the countries in the global north have been better able both to reopen and to arrange uh, remote learning opportunities that are more robust for kids. I wonder for both of you, and there's a lot of questions coming in from viewers, so I want to get to some of those specifics, but, um, you know, what can schools try to do or communities to stop these growing gaps? And also when we think about it in the United States, there's also this growing racial gap, for example, in um, student test performances too, that we're finding. And um, so I, Mira, just to follow up, I wanted to ask you about that, but also then Mark, I'd love to get to some of the science around what are some of the control measures that schools and communities can really act on right now to ensure that students can get these supports and, and learning opportunities. Mark, do you wanna go first and then I'll go? Um, sure, uh, so I think that um, obviously one of the best things we can do is to try to get schools back in session um, to the extent possible. And there are multiple ways to do that. Um, one is, uh, I mean, one class of, of um, interventions is improving ventilation and air cleaning. Joe Allen at the Chan School has been very active in, in promoting that aspect and in disseminating information about, uh, about the um, ways to do that. Uh, being outdoors or opening windows or, or the like. Um, so I think that's a very large class of interventions. Um, another class of interventions is ways of uh, reducing density uh, in the school building, which has the same effect. Um, and, uh, and I think then the, in the more technological approaches uh, or the more disease specific approaches would include um, making vaccines available to especially adults who are vulnerable to make it more attractive for them to come back because uh, they, through their unions, teachers have the power to um, affect school policy, school opening policy. And, um, and also, uh, if we had a better testing infrastructure, and we're still very, very far from that, um, we could use testing to, um, to improve the ability of schools to stay open and um, understand transmission and stop transmission in a more targeted way than just uh, closing down a whole classroom or the like. Um, I think you mentioned the new variants, and I think we should talk about that uh, maybe in a few minutes, but um, I think things could get the, the situation could change if a more transmissible variant is uh, becomes common. As in school closures again. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Can I, yeah, yeah. so chiming in on this, I think one of the huge challenges right now for um, reopening schools and keeping them open is trust. Um, uh, right now, so, you know, Mark mentioned the power of teacher unions, um, and right now there's immense mistrust, I think, among us, teachers unions, particularly, uh, well, we're in the United States, um, that are strongest often in um, cities that serve predominantly low-income uh, families of color. Uh, and the teachers unions feel mistrusted by the administration, the district's administration. Families also feel mistrusted by, and they feel mistrust of the districts. And so what we see is that actually, even when say districts do reopen, such as say New York City, um, 
You have fewer than a third of families opting in to send their children to school. Mm -hmm. And what we see is very clear patterns, again, in the United States, of those families who are opting in being pretty systematically families uh, with uh, privilege. So we see white families and Asian families disproportionately opting in, and we're seeing middle class and upper middle class families disproportionately opting in. Uh, this is actually related to private schools, which on the whole are open, um, again, because they have both the resources and the trust built up. And so this is one way in which we see the exacerbation, actually, of inequities in schools. And it means that there's a real tension right now. Although, as Mark is saying, for the moment, the science really does seem to suggest that with the proper infection control measures, we could open schools quite safely. And if we were actually serious about reopening schools, we could do things like go into um, office buildings that are right now empty. We could uh, have partnerships with faith-based organizations, with churches, with community centers, YMCAs. We could actually spread school out in a way that would be safe and we could invest in the kind of infection control measures we need. But um, we are, you know, we're not being serious about that. And there is this question, if families are going to keep their children home anyway, because they do not trust that their children or their families will be kept safe, should we be focusing on those innovations or should we be focusing on trying to improve remote learning? And I think there are strong equity arguments in favor of both. Mm. Um, there's so many questions coming in and it sounds like trust is such a big factor, what you're saying in addressing these inequities as well as one big driving force of it. Um, this question, um, Mark, should teachers in, for example, in Massachusetts be moved up on the vaccine line? Uh, why or why not? Um, well, that's been a, a, a obviously a very uh, hot issue and um, teachers are at a relatively early position along with other uh, I forgot the term, I think it's critical frontline workers, if I remember correctly, the term we arrived at on the vaccine advisory panel that I serve on. Um, so they are, uh, they are um, in the next uh, large group um, after, uh, after 75 year olds and those with two comorbidities. Um, the, uh, if if all goes well, or even with a little bit of wiggle room, if all doesn't go perfectly well, that should be in time for next school year. Um, I think it's hard to imagine getting a large amount of vaccine uptake in time to rescue much of this school year, um, even if teachers were put at the very top. So, um, so I think that uh, um, the, the current position is is appropriate. Um, but I mean, having said that, everybody should get it immediately, of course, that's the it's not that it's not that there's a benefit to anybody waiting, it's that there's a limited supply. So if we can enhance supply, that would, of course, uh, speed things up. Um Mira, how this question comes from a, a viewer. How do uh, teachers and, and students connect or what are some ways given like everyone's wearing masks and, and there's like that emotional, the, the, there's that covering of often emotional expression or communication. Um, what are you seeing in that regard? So, I mean, one of the things that's really, uh, that makes me admire teachers so much um, is that they are immensely creative and really good teachers have uh, what, what we call the jargon is a pedagogical repertoire, right? You think of a toolbox of pedagogies that you can pull out and there is so much that you can communicate um, and so many ways to communicate uh, from, I mean, it's amazing what some of the early childhood educators are doing in terms of imagination, in terms of, um, doing feeling check-ins and acting out our feelings uh, as uh, we have the number of projects. Uh, so project-based learning has, to my excitement, actually become more elevated, right, in this uh, period in part because you might need to give assignments that students can do on their own for a while in part because you can't rely on students having access necessarily to all the same materials. And so there's really wonderful projects that student that teachers and students uh, can work on 
one that give teachers insight into students' lives and students' insights into each other's lives, right? Whether they're exploring their backyard in science, whether they're doing oral histories uh, with their families and connecting them to major time points. Um, uh, teachers have been, I mean, whether or not school is remote, you see so many teachers who are driving to their students' houses, who are having porch talks with them, who are hosting um, classes in, you know, the parking lot of the school, who are riding the school bus that is bringing Wi-Fi around, and they are visiting the students who are, you know, coming uh, to use the Wi-Fi. I mean, this is one of the things is that the teachers, we've been doing this uh, set of conversations with educators from around the globe. And uh, one of the really consistent things that we've been hearing is that the, you know, it has always been the true that teaching is sort of a 24 seven profession, but it's now become, you know, a 28 eight kind of profession that they're always on. And that, um, you know, if they can't see their students in the classroom, they are they're just traveling and they're doing so much work and they're texting with students and they're snapping with students. Like, I mean, the innovation and the creativity is amazing. It's also just a recipe for total burnout. Yeah. Um, this question's from the world's Facebook page. How will schools evaluate what went right or wrong? Like, uh, because I imagine those factors play into, um, and, and family or household factors into why some children may thrive in distance learning situations and others aren't. I worry, so that's, a, I think, a great question, and it's important to think of it also as a forward-looking question and not only a looking-back question, because one of the things that I think um, people like my husband have been really clear about is that there's no reason to think that this will be um, the last pandemic that we ever see, right? Um, and so part of some of the groups that I've been part of have been talking about how we create pandemic-resilient schools moving forward. Um, and so I think, right, part of that um, taking account, therefore, needs to be about learning lessons that can be applied, although flexibly, because the next pandemic may be different from this pandemic, right? So there are really basic questions about touch points with kids, about, you know, what students report, what parents report, um, what kinds of skills have students developed that are both within the curriculum, but also outside the curriculum, right? What ways have children been able to demonstrate resilience? Have they gained skills in baking or in caring for family members, right? And I think what we need to make sure of is that we do not merely hold schools accountable or hold teachers accountable uh, for phenomena that are in both incredibly complex and as always in education, frankly, mostly de dependent on um, features outside of uh, schools and education, right? You know, schools and classrooms. So again, the teachers and the schools are working incredibly hard and we do need to figure out what's been working there and how to carry those lessons forward. But we should not then immediately turn around and bash teachers or schools for what are inevitably, unfortunately, going to be really massive further inequities, losses of skills and knowledge, and really trauma, right, that kids have been experiencing. Mark, we're getting this. Oh, please. Sorry, could I, yeah. can I add something to that? I think from the public health side, I think one thing that this really has, experience has really demonstrated is that having functioning schools is, is a job that public health has to enhance, uh, be ready to enhance. Um, as some examples, most of the best, much of the best data on the impact of schools reopening and closing and the like has come from the UK where they have a much more intense surveillance system where they're testing people at random in the community. Um, lots of countries are doing that. Rwanda's doing that. We're not doing that in any serious way, um, thanks to our uh, uh, kneecapping of the CDC, to put it gently. Um, uh, and uh, and thanks to the consequences of that for how much extra work state health departments are doing. Um, so, so we need better data. I think we need also to really think through how are we going to um, uh, manage future pandemics and uh, how will testing work and how will we uh, deploy technologies to make the schools safer. Um, and then of course, much of the intersection between public health and schools is just basic hygiene in schools. And 
uh, as we were discussing earlier, um, there are a lot of public schools that, uh, at least before the pandemic, didn't have any soap in their bathrooms. Uh, that's a public health problem. Um, and, uh, and it's not only a problem in, in pandemic times, um, all the way up to ventilation and uh, fresh air in the schools. And um, all of that is, uh, is a kind of investment that we should be making regardless of pandemics, but that will uh, further uh, help our ability to be pandemic resilient. Um, I want to just follow up. You mentioned the UK, you mentioned testing. We've got a couple of questions that have come in about testing in schools. One is, um, you know, there hasn't, for example, been adequate testing to meet the massive sur demand for, for these things in schools. Is there an, a different approach that's needed? needed? And like, what would that look like? Um, and additionally, there's a more specific question that comes from uh, asking about the uh, usefulness and availability of rapid antigen tests to keep schools open. So I'll throw that out to both of you because I imagine that this is being circulating in both of your circles. Um, yeah. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that uh, that there's the the sort of improving on the current system of testing. And uh, as my colleague at the Chan School, Michael Minna, has been saying for quite some time now, if a system isn't working, we should try something new rather than just complaining about how badly it's working. And Rapid tests have uh, have some complexities and don't give you uh, perfect answers for clinical purposes, but um, I think rapid antigen tests could be scaled up to a point where they are an important piece of the solution for keeping schools open. Um, and uh, I think the the lack of innovation has been very unfortunate. Um, and again traceable to a lack of federal leadership um, because the federal government is in control of what can be done uh, in terms of testing. I will say, uh, and Mark, you should correct me if I'm wrong on this. Um, well, I do know that the vast majority of schools that have been open over the last six months uh, or so have not actually had systematic testing in place. Uh, in fact, most of them have had no testing in place. Uh, so the surveillance testing that Mark is talking about in the UK, for example, is an incredible source of data. It's not that they have been testing kids in schools for the purposes right. of deciding right whether to keep schools open. Um, and that's been true in even the most um, effective uh, schools and districts like Taiwan, Singapore, uh, which have had incredibly low uh, cases and outbreaks. Like Taiwan has a policy that they will shut schools down if they have two cases in a school. They've never had that yet, right? So um, uh, although clearly testing would be better, I think it's pretty clear also that you can keep schools open uh, without having uh, access to testing. Hmm. Um this question comes from Jeff, and it, you know, we are running out of time, but um, I hope to get to some more of these. You know, if there's a scientific consensus that elementary schools are not major vectors for transmission, it sounds like what both of you are saying, yet we have this profoundly difficult time getting our schools open. A big part of this is the failure to make teachers feel safe. Um, you've alluded to this, um, but how can we get these schools open faster and um, without making teachers feel railroaded into work that threatens their health. Um, again, I, I, it would be great to hear both of you weigh in on this um, as we've been having this conversation, but that seems to be a big point and issue here. Yeah, I mean, I think um, here, this is a problem I think that's actually fairly specific to the United States, right? Um, in many other countries, most other countries throughout the world, they have reopened schools. So I was saying that we have, you know, right now about a quarter billion uh, students who are affected uh, directly by school closures. That's 22 countries around the world. And then we have, that are fully closed. And then we have, you know, some uh, mix and match, including in India, which is accounting for a lot of that, right? That, that most of their schools there are closed, although there's a, a fair amount of variation too. Um, but most countries actually have managed to open their schools. And that's in part because in fact, in most countries, teachers have an elevated social status um, uh, where they are 
seen as being people who des- professionals who deserve respect. Uh, they are often civil servants, uh, you know, sort of seen as civil servants. They have a relationship. They they may have a lot of power. Um, or they may have less power, but but there is a there is a relationship of trust, and so then when they are called on to step up and be in person, there is a greater willingness to do it. Right now, unfortunately, we don't have those kinds of relationships in the United States, and also, frankly, because of the politicization of school opening uh, last July, uh, that I think is actually what turned this, unfortunately into a, um, a political football as opposed to a collective enterprise. Hmm. I think really until President Trump and, and Education Secretary uh, Betsy DeVos uh, walked in in July and said, we must get schools open. There actually was a spirit of collaboration with everybody agreeing, we must get schools open. But when it, be- when it turned from a collaborative effort into a political mandate, that's when we saw the divide, I think, start. And it's going to be really hard to rebuild or to build up for the first time the kind of mutual trust that's required. Mark, how, yeah. for, from your end, how can teachers feel safe? And also, at what point do you determine schools shouldn't be open? How do you determine that? Yeah, um, I think Mira's pretty much said it. I think it is a political and a social problem more than a scientific or epidemiological problem. Um, I would say that the um, the arrival of the new variant that may be more transmissible is potentially a challenge to the view that, uh, or, or potentially will change the facts on the ground. Um, that is to say, um, contagion is a continuous, how contagious something is, is a continuous number. It's not it is contagious or it's not contagious. So something that is somewhat transmissible, um, but not enough to spark outbreaks in schools very often um, right now could become, if it, if the new variant is indeed uh, becomes more, more common in the United States as it is in the UK and is more transmissible as we believe it to be, then, uh, then schools may not be uh, so safe uh, anymore. That's not now, and, and it's not something um, that we should change our policy for now, but I think that is a serious consideration that, uh, and a reason why it's really important to try to keep these new variants at bay. Mm. Um, you know, this question comes from Anna, Julia. Uh, it's kind of a straight up question. How has online learning impacted students academically? Um, just from that remote nature itself, are students doing worse? Yes, they're doing worse. (laughs) Um, uh, We have really clear evidence of that. Uh, They're doing worse in that they're not showing up as much. They're not showing up as consistently. They are uh, not um, doing as much when they do show up. Uh, And, uh, you know, they're not engaging in the same ways. The inequities are getting worse, et cetera. But so that's the second part of the answer to it, which is it's an incredibly heterogeneous pool we're talking about. So for probably 20% of kids in the United States um, and many, many around the world, right, whose access to remote learning is through the radio or maybe through a television station uh, or through mailed packets and so forth, they may be getting basically nothing, Mm -hmm. right? They they may truly have now stopped getting schooling. For the most privileged kids, say in the United States, as I said, the vast majority of private schools are open. Um, Frankly, one of our daughters, we live in Boston, one of our daughters is going to school in person at a private school four days a week. The Boston public schools have not been open, she's a ninth grader, the Boston public schools have not been open to high schoolers since last March, right? Mm. I mean, that's an amazing inequity. And then when she is online, or when our other daughter, who's a high school senior, is online, what they are getting is small classes, high levels of technical support, um, you know, a a school that can count on every child having a decent internet connection, except that ours drops from time to time, but right, like they're, they're the, the online education may just not be that bad. It's not ideal, but it's really not that bad. So when you ask about what remote schooling is like, 
the question is, uh, it, it, the answer is, it's almost anything, <laughs> depending on who you're looking at. Um, that's a lot. Um, I feel like we're just scratching the surface, but we actually have to start wrapping up. Um, Mark, I want to just give you a chance. I know you've got to log off um, uh, for just some closing statements about this topic. And also one thing I'm curious about with the two of you, how your differing um, vantage points on this pandemic might inform one another and how you even analyze or what you learn from one another from a you know education view versus an infectious disease view. So Mark, give you a chance to wrap up and, and then Mira as well. Yeah, I mean, I think from from the perspective of an infectious disease epidemiologist, this pandemic has been totally shocking in the in the role of children. Nobody would have uh, I, that I know of would have predicted that there would be a virus that um, is where young children are not very easy to infect and don't don't transmit very much. Um, so I think that's just been a very strange uh, and fortunate. Um, aspect of this virus. There aren't very many good things about it, but that is one good thing about it. Um, so I think uh, that that's just one of the big surprises. In terms of the interaction, um, you know, I think sometimes because epidemiologists, especially early on, uh, the responsible ones were saying we have to do everything we can to, uh, to stop this. And um, uh, sometimes there's a portrayal that epidemiologists just don't care about anything except the virus. And uh, I don't think that's accurate for any of us, but, um, but uh, I've been certainly reminded frequently by, by conversations with Mira that, you know, these decisions have major consequences and uh, that societal functioning really does matter. Um, and I persist in, in my view that uh, that most of the control measures, uh, putting aside school closures for a minute, most of the control measures are the best way to keep uh, society functioning um, uh, because the virus itself is more destructive than the closures. But um, but I think it is important to take it on a case by case basis and and be rational about it. So uh, as usual, my wife is the source of rationality for me. <laughs> Yeah, I found it. So one of the things that I've actually learned about epidemiology and actually about Mark um, is how much epidemiologists think about patterns um, and sort of big pictures and models rather than, you know, the very specific question of I live in this community, this is the school that my child is supposed to go to, is it safe to send them there? So one of the kind of bizarre features actually of the last 10 months has been that often I have been the one making the decisions about do we let our child go to a backyard birthday party with five other kids when they're going to be masked and this is the side of the backyard? And I would, you know, ask Mark that in April and he would say, I don't know, I can't like, you know, I can, I can tell you about populations. I can't tell you about that birthday party, right? And so it's been kind of fascinating to me to um, uh, live with somebody who knows, you know, more about population level stuff than most other people in the world, and yet realize still how hard it is to make decisions for our own family, to have, you know, people who would email me because they would think that I would be the right conduit to Mark to say, you know, my district is thinking of opening up or this or whatever. And, you know, I would occasionally log those questions over to him as we're making dinner. And usually the answer would be, I don't know, both because that's not what our models are designed to do is to answer these specific questions, but also we don't have the data, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the other thing that's I've, that's been really striking to me is educators, um, particularly educators serving uh, vulnerable and uh, historically marginalized communities are used to working under conditions of you know, systemic injustice. We usually though think that we have information about our choices. And now as educators, we are having to function under conditions really of extreme lack of knowledge. And uh, even though the scientists and the epidemiologists are doing their best to uh, find that knowledge, and that's been hard for everybody, I think. We'll stop there. Oh, okay. Sorry, I thought we were gonna um, 
Well, thank you both for all your generous time. And so that concludes this discussion. Um, Mira and Mark, thank you for this. Um, this is a Q&A jointly presented by the forum at Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the World from PRX and GBH. View the full discussion on our Facebook pages, send feedback at Forum HSPH and at PRI The World, and join the forum again on January 22nd at noon Eastern for a discussion about COVID-19 and the vaccine rollout.